Afternoon, everyone. My name's Kim Holmes. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Heritage Foundation. I'd like to welcome all of you to the Heritage Foundation. I'd also like to welcome our online viewers, uh, which we I think we have a considerable number of. It is uh, a privilege and an honor to introduce our program and our, especially our special guest today. Uh, as a courtesy to our speaker, though, I would like to say at the outset, if you could uh, check your mobile devices and make sure they're either silenced or turned off, it would be a, a great courtesy to, uh, to the speaker. First, let me say a few words about today's topic. The uh, conservative movement cherishes fusionism today, just as it always has. Conservatives have always judged policies based upon a set of principles that blends the thinking of social conservatives, free market economists, and a belief in a strong national defense. Now that means that uh, we recognize the tremendous utility of the free enterprise system, and we seek to protect it from misguided government intervention. Free enterprise has lifted tens of millions of Americans out of poverty and allowed generation after generation of striving and hardworking individuals to achieve the American dream. Indeed, it's economic freedom that makes America the land of opportunity. Today, we are seeing some people in the name of conservatism who want to open up more space for the federal government to manage the economy. They claim the wealth gap has been created by capitalism and has caused stagnation among typical American workers. And we think that's a fundamental misunderstanding of how the economy works. And we are working to make sure that the principles of limited government and free enterprise are not forgotten as today's policymakers seek to apply a conservative mindset to governing in the 21st century. And that's why we are so pleased to host Senator Toomey who has been a very effective spokesman for the benefits of capitalism. Senator Toomey is a staunch supporter of policies that support individual liberty, free enterprise, and limited government. He's one of the main architects of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which cut taxes for all income groups and made the corporate tax code competitive with developed countries around the world. He is currently working to make expiring provisions of the tax code permanent. And Senator Toomey has also led efforts to cut excess regulations. Senator Toomey serves as a member of the Senate Finance, Banking, and Budget Committees. Before serving in the Senate, uh, Senator Toomey served three terms in the U.S. House of Representatives. He owned and operated a chain of family restaurants in Pennsylvania with his brothers, and he was the president of the Club for Growth. Please welcome to the stage a great friend of the Heritage Foundation, a strong conservative, Senator Pat Toomey. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, Kim, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. I appreciate it. Uh, but uh, even more, I want to thank you for um, giving me this forum today, giving me this chance to share some thoughts. And, uh, and really, I couldn't think of a better place to... Uh, share this message than the Heritage Foundation. Uh, I have had so much respect and benefited so much from my uh, interactions with the Heritage Foundation for literally decades now. Uh, clearly the home of so many of the thought leaders for the conservative movement, how we should think about public policy challenges. Heritage has been a stalwart and I am grateful to the folks at Heritage. Thanks for taking the time to be with us today. I was just told that I might be, this might be the last public event at any of the major think tanks in town. You know, you'd think there was like a virus going around or something. Um, so I am gonna try not to keep you here terribly long, but I, but I wanna uh, thank you for being here so that we can have this discussion. And so what I wanna talk about uh, this afternoon is what I perceive as a relatively new and somewhat distinct threat to our free enterprise, our capitalist system. Um, it's not the old threat that has always been there, the threat that has come from the left, folks who have openly disdained capitalism, the, the 
people who are either explicitly socialist or, or have those leanings. That threat is alive and well, by the way. Um, the politics of vilifying capitalism and freedom and economic freedom and business, is, that is alive and well. And we see new manifestations of that that include now the idea that uh, all kinds of um, services and goods should be simply provided by, for, by the government for free and the government should just confiscate the savings of uh, productive people as the way to pay for that. So that's all alive and well. Uh, I, I would say, in fact, um, it's, it's gotten worse in some important ways. Um, the democratic consensus seems to me used to be mostly about tweaking capitalism in ways that uh, the more liberal folks thought it ought to be changed. And now there's an element of really outright rejecting capitalism, right? Bernie Sanders explicitly ran on a campaign of a political revolution. It is, it is that kind of language and, and words have meaning. And I would argue that Elizabeth Warren, for that matter, advocates all of the same policies. I might just choose to call it by a different name. So all of that is alive and well. But the threat that I want to talk about is the emergence of a skepticism, I will call it, about cap capitalism that has come from the right. And that is, that is unusual. I think it's fair to say the premise of the center-right capitalism skeptics is simply that capitalism is failing too many people. And there, uh, you, you know, it takes various forms, but there's a sense that capitalism has left behind the middle class, the working class, that our economy is hollowing out, manufacturing has uh, been eroded badly, we have a lower standard of living, that it's capitalism that's causing the collapse of our communities, our civil society, even families, and in fact, capitalism is guilty of driving uh, the diseases of despair. Um, drug addiction, alcoholism, suicide. Um, we have many allies uh, in the conservative movement and the center-right um, coalition that are adopting these, um, this premise, um, this sort of hyphenated capitalism is the way uh, I sometimes characterize it. Our friends at the Business Roundtable um, talk about stakeholder capitalism, which has, in my view, implicitly accepts the premise that there's something wrong with capitalism as we know it. And so they are advocating that the owners of capital, the owners of business, ha that their interests should be subordinated to some vague and somewhat undefined set of stakeholders instead. Um, Oren Cass, a, a very, very bright, capable, thoughtful uh, man, uh, he's a former senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute. He was the domestic policy director for the Romney 2012 presidential campaign. So he comes kind of from the heart of uh, the Republican conservative party. Um, he has been um, a, a thought leader on this, as I call it, hyphenated capitalism. He complained about heritage, Vice President Jack Spencer's view on policy. Jack asked the question, why don't we look at a policy and just ask, does it expand economic freedom? To which Orrin Cass replied, because there's more to life than economic freedom. And he went on to launch the think tank called American Compass, which is dedicated to, and I quote, helping American conservatism recover from its chronic case of market fundamentalism, end quote. And now we have some of my colleagues, uh, Republican uh, colleagues adopting the language that really originates from the left with respect to free markets, uh, suggesting that it's free markets that's driving inequality, that free markets don't serve the common good. And uh, I think it's worth a quick aside to be clear about what a market is, right? Um, the market that is occasionally vilified, or at least criticized, um, it's really just the name that we assign to the sum total of all the voluntary exchanges that occur every day by free men and women participating in a marketplace. When people choose to buy or sell a product or a service, it's in, in a free society, it's always because they believe that it benefits them to engage in that transaction or they wouldn't do it. That's what it is, right? That's what we call a market. Now, it's hard to vilify the freedom to engage in tra voluntary transactions, it's easier to give it a name and then uh, go from there. Here's what's really problematic. The prescription that our friends who have this 
relatively new skepticism about capitalism, the prescription that they advocate in all cases is to expand the power and the role of the government and reduce the economic freedom of individual Americans because they think that will cure the ills that they blame on capitalism. That is, of course, necessarily the prescription if you are rejecting some element of capitalism because capitalism is nothing more than economic freedom. To reject that pretty much by definition means you're advocating curbing that freedom. So we see, again, the Business Roundtable uh, advocates the end of the primacy of shareholders with respect to the governance of a company. And it also advocates things like government mandated wages, mandated paid leave policies. Um, Orrin Cass um, has explicitly advocated that we have a federally dictated industrial policy where we will pick sectors and industries that we decide should be favorably treated and those that should be disfavorably treated. It includes less free trade so that we can control which kinds of things people are able to buy and sell and under what circumstances. Um, I have colleagues who advocate punishing companies that engage in buying back their own stock, which is simply a mechanism for returning capital to the people whose capital it is. Um, some have suggested we impose a new tax uh, when a stock buyback occurs. Um, we have those advocating, again, colleagues, advocating that the executive have even more power and discretion to levy tariffs, despite the fact that the Constitution assigns that responsibility exclusively to Congress. Um, and we have people who are advocating new limits to foreign direct investment. Um, so when I look at this, and I look at where this is coming from, it strikes me as maybe the most serious threat to economic freedom and prosperity in a long time, because it's coming from our allies. It's coming from people with whom we have historically been allied. Um, this center-right communalism, if you will, or center-right Bernie Sanders light, I'm not sure exactly what to call it, but it is meant to be a dagger thrust into the heart of the traditional center-right consensus that maximizing economic growth is part of what we're all about. It's very much an attack on that premise. Um, I do think it's well-intended, but I think it's misguided, and I want to tell you why I think these folks are wrong. So first of all, let me concede, there are absolutely are very serious problems and challenges that we have throughout our society. We do have communities that have been left behind. Uh, we have social pathologies that are very, very serious in their scale. Drug addiction is up very, very significantly over the last 20 years. The suicide rate has gone up in that same period of time. Marriage and fertility rates are down. Church and, and civil society generally have seen a decline in membership and participation. No question, all of those things are empirically true. But do we really think that capitalism is the primary cause of these social and cultural pathologies? Um, I am unconvinced that that's the principal driver for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is we have had a capitalist system for really hundreds of years on this continent and the vast majority of that time, while capitalism was the uh, economic model, drug addiction was very low, and marriage rates were very high, and fertility rates were high, and civil society thrived. In fact, many of these social pathologies started to get worse during the late 1960s, which was long before we had a really globally integrated economy, which is one of the aspects of capitalism that is most frequently derided seems to me it's almost certainly the case that there are multiple factors that have contributed to the pockets of economic stagnation and the social pathologies that, that we do find across our country. One I think we should candidly acknowledge is probably the welfare state. It does certainly dramatically reduce the value of and the importance of a nuclear family. Um, it makes productive work and the safety net of civil society certainly less important at, at a minimum, um, maybe even less necessary. Um, consider the fact that our, our Democratic friends are very, very united behind the idea that we have a $15 an hour minimum wage across the country. Um, interestingly, the Cato uh, Institute recently did a study that found that if we adopted that in a quarter of our states, it would still pay more to be on welfare than to be working. Um, 
I think public the public education monopoly is clearly doing a disservice to very, very substantial numbers of our kids who are graduating from a school without having had the education they deserve. And should we be surprised that their prospects are not as hopeful as they might be? Um, I think also sometimes um, less uh, acknowledged is a certain social stigma that has, and I think continues to be attached to young adults who pursue a career in the trades rather than a traditional four-year college degree, despite the fact that the, the vocational training and the jobs available in the trades are really terrific. Across Pennsylvania, there are a tremendous range of opportunities for people who are uh, take the time to develop the skills um, that, are, that are needed, and there are many needed. But having said that, I think there's a more fundamental level at which the critics and skeptics of capitalism are wrong, and that is the notion that it's failing too many people. First of all, I would hope we could all acknowledge that globally and historically, capitalism should rank up there with the invention of the wheel and written language as one of the greatest of human achievements. Um, look at it, think about it this way. It took almost 2,000 years from the time of Julius Caesar to the time of George Washington for the Western world's standard of living to double. 2,000 years for our standard of living to double. And those two leaders both rode into battle on the same mode of transportation. Then we developed democratic capitalism and applied it consistently. And we started to double our standard of living every 20 years. That's a breathtaking improvement in the human condition. Um, our, our, our critics of capitalism often like to suggest that, well, manufacturing is in a huge decline. We've, we've hollowed out our economy. We don't have a robust manufacturing sector anymore. And that's because of the pursuit of ever cheaper means of production. Um, this is just factually wrong, in my view. Um, it is true that manufacturing employment is down. That is true. In uh, 1953, about a third of our workforce was engaged in manufacturing. Today, it's a little less than 9%. But total manufacturing output is actually at a record high. And in fact, if, if you adjust for the different rates of inflation in the manufacturing sector versus service sectors, and you make that adjustment, then it turns out that the manufacturing sector in real dollars is as big as a percentage of GDP as it was in the 1950s. That's not widely uh, discussed, but that's, that's a fact. Um, so why is it that employment is down so much? It's a simple reason. It's productivity. Um, productivity gains have been enormous. Uh, automation, robotics. Um, we, what we are seeing in manufacturing is what the story of economic progress has always been, doing more with fewer hours of labor and less uh, back-breaking work, that's what's happened in manufacturing, as it did in agriculture. Right? And it was not, in, you know, a century ago, or, or a century and a half ago. Probably a big majority of the population of the United States was on the farm. Today, it's about two percent. Are we worse off? No, we're not. We're, we're better, and we produce more and a more greater diversity of agricultural products than ever before. That is the story in manufacturing as well. Um, some colleagues that, uh, in this you know, category of newly skeptical about capitalism like to blame trade for their perce perceived decline in manufacturing. But economists Michael Hicks and Sukrit Devaraj, I apologize if I mispronounce that name, They've done a lot of work in this, and they've shown that from 2000 to 2010, a period that they studied closely, about 10% of manufacturing job losses in America they believe are attributable to trade. 90% were attributable to automation and production efficiencies. Um, getting, looking beyond and more broadly than just manufacturing per se, across the country, you know, for all the problems that we undoubtedly have, the fact is, life is better today than it has ever been for the vast majority of the American people. Um, to refute that, some folks would suggest, well, wages have been relatively stagnant. Um, well, first of all, 
wages aren't that stagnant. There's been growth in wages, but there's something more important. Wage is, is a interesting and an important metric, but its re real value is the extent to which it speaks to an improved standard of living. That's the purpose of a wage, is to allow a person to enjoy a standard of living. And there's no question that the standard of living of middle class and working class Americans has improved over recent decades. Uh, on average, uh, working class Americans live in larger, more comfortable homes. Uh, you know, in, in 1973, the average home was 1,525 square feet. Um, by last year, it was almost 2,300 square feet. It's a 50% increase. In 1981, less than 60% of middle income family homes had air conditioning. Today, over 90% have air conditioning. We, we all, including working class and middle folks, drive safer and more comfortable vehicles. Cars are twice as safe today as they were in the 1950s. And since then, and because of the new safety technologies, um, we've probably saved over 600,000 lives. How do you quantify the value for a family of not having lost their teenage son uh, in a car accident? Uh, not to mention all the conveniences like the satellite radio, the seat warmers, the lane departure warnings, the backup camera, all of the things that were, were inconceivable. No one had even imagined these things just 20, uh, maybe certainly 30 or 40 years ago. How about the fact that we have virtually all of the information in the world available in your hand? It's, it's an incredible incredible um, source of value for people, but it's hard to quantify what that's worth. Um, in 1990, 19% of households even had any kind of computer, and those were a very rudimentary computer. Today, over 90% have computers and or smartphones, and they have this unlimited information and entertainment services and apps at their ready disposal all day long. In 1990, 0% of households had broadband internet. Today, over 80% do, and that number is growing every day. Uh, we live longer. In 1970, the life expectancy in the US was 70. Today, it's 79. We've cured diseases that we had no hope to cure before, and I think we're on the threshold of curing many, many more. We can treat diseases that we couldn't treat or cure in the past. The quality of our health is unquestionably much better. I think really by any reasonable measure, there's a higher standard of living in America today than there was in the past when people just fondly look back and I think mistakenly think that uh, everything was so much better. Um, so things are better uh, and it, life continues to get better, right? Um, we still have economic mobility. We have wages that are growing. In fact, recently they've been growing at an accelerating pace. The number of people living in poverty has been in decline. In 2016, the Urban Institute uh, looked at five income groups and measured their change since 1979. They looked at the poor, the rich, and lower and middle and upper middle class. Their analysis, right, not, not radical right-wing folks over at the Urban Institute, right? Their analysis is that the, the, the membership in the poorest category shrunk by 4.5%. Participation in the upper and uh, upper middle class and the rich was up nearly 19%. Uh, wage growth has been occurring across the board. It's been growing at a at the, the highest pace uh, for minorities who have historically had wages lagging behind, and um, and people with less education. In, in last year, the average wage gain was 3.2%. But for non high school grads, right, the hardest to employ folks. Wage gains were 6.9%. Um, I, I think the most recent empirical experiment in expanding economic freedom has happened over these last several years when we reformed our tax code in ways that certainly expand freedom. We rolled back regulation that, that we thought was excessive. Uh, we, we confirmed judges to courts who uh, have a, an understanding of the limited role they're supposed to play. Um, the result was the economic expansion accelerated. We've reached the lowest unemployment in 50 years. Uh, since 2016, we have 7 million more jobs, 7 million fewer people on food stamps, a million more job openings across America than there are people looking for jobs across America. Think about that. This has not persisted in my lifetime.
to have this kind of opportunity across the board. Um, so I, I reject the notion that capitalism has somehow failed our society in uh, material terms. Um, but I'd also ask why should we think that the prescription that our friends in this center-right capitalist skeptic category, why we would think that the prescription they advocate, namely replacing the power of markets with the power of government, why do they think that would work? Um, why would we think that less freedom is going to lead to more happiness? Uh, Oren Cass acknowledges that his prescriptions will lead to slower economic growth, lower consumption, higher costs for consumers. Um, that's a big price to pay for the hope that somehow we're going to have um, great social outcomes. On trade, this group is increasingly skeptical, questioning the premise of free trade, which of course is simply allowing Americans to choose from whom they're going to purchase products so that they can achieve savings when that's possible, which they then can use to purchase other goods and services that enhance the standard of living that they're able to enjoy. If you ask me, centralizing decision making with the political class is not going to lead to better outcomes. It's going to lead to market distortions, it's going to be higher costs, and ultimately lower wages and a lower standard of living. And there's another problem. Every time we get away from allowing markets to make these decisions and we put this power in the hands of politicians and government, the government inevitably, necessarily, starts picking winners and losers. Uh, some are advocating this. I think um, the, the uh, CAS think tank openly advocates favoring the manufacturing sector over the service sector despite the fact that wages are higher in the service sectors. I, I don't get that. But in addition, when the government has that power, it invites corruption and political favoritism, inevitably. Uh, I'll give you a quick story uh, from Pennsylvania that I think illustrates the kind of danger of giving government too much power in, in the economy. It's a story of a company called ATI, Allegheny Technology Institute is the full name. It goes by the acronym ATI. And they are a global manufacturer of specialty uh, steels, steel products. Um, a majority of the, st the steel that they make, it ends up as stainless steel slabs that are, that are then used, I think, mostly for uh, appliance uh, uh, manufacturing. There is a component kind of steel that they can neither produce themselves nor can they purchase it domestically. It's just generally not available. So they set up a joint venture with the firm in Indonesia to supply them with the slabs, the raw material they need to make the end product. Uh, along come the tariffs on steel. It applies to their uh, imported steel and it makes them completely uncompetitive with respect to their final product. It's just too expensive, uh, an input. So ATI went and requested an exclusion. It went to the Commerce Department and explained the circumstances and said, surely you didn't intend to make us, this Pennsylvania steel manufacturer, uncompetitive by raising the cost of our raw materials, so please grant us an exclusion. Well, that is necessarily a public request, and when it is made, guess who notices? All of their competitors. All of their competitors took note. And they weighed in and insisted that the exclusion not be granted because they said, we can provide that steel. Just have them come to us. Well, it's true. There are competitors to ATI that can provide that steel. And when they called them for prices, you won't be surprised to learn that the prices were through the roof. The prices were at levels that where the raw material would cost more than what ATI could sell the finished good for. Obviously, not possible to sustain. As of today, they have not, they, ATI, have not been granted the exclusion. And there's 100 steel workers at a plant in Pennsylvania who could be out of work anytime soon because this is not a viable business model as long as the government is engaging in this practice. This is the kind of thing that happens when we empower the political process to decide what ought to be decided by, by markets. Um, an exclusion that would be um, helpful for one company and would restore the normal market uh, for them is harmful for someone else and somebody, in this case in the Commerce Department, decides who's going to benefit and who's not. So my question is, 
is this really the role of government? Is this really what we conservatives want the government to be doing to manipulate these outcomes? Uh, in my view, the purpose of government, the fundamental purpose of government was to defend our freedom. A nation conceived in liberty to protect our rights, neither labor nor its fruits are privileges bestowed by the government. These are intrinsic rights of our, of our own. And to what are we individuals entitled? Well, James Madison addressed that in a 1792 essay entitled Property. He said, and I quote, a just government is that which impartially secures to every man whatever is his own, end quote. A little more recently, Kevin Williamson put it well, I thought, when he said, and I quote, capitalism is not a rival to common good. Capitalism, meaning security in one's own property and the right to work and trade, is the common good that government exists to secure. Contrast Madison's vision with that of our allies, our center-right skeptics, they're now demanding that companies must share their profits with workers above and beyond the wages that are paid to workers. But after a company has paid the wages and all the other expenses of operating, what's left over is the profit that belongs to the shareholder. What is the right of the government to come along and confiscate that and decide that it's going to be handed out to other people? I would suggest there's also a political danger in going down this road. And what I mean is that the Republican Party has historically been the party that has represented the coalition of center-right believers. It's been the party that has defended our freedom, especially and including economic freedom. And it now has people within openly advocating for diminishing that freedom for the sake of what they believe will be more uniform outcomes, which they think is desirable trade. This is an idea that is meant to break up the fusion coalition that Kim alluded to when he, when he uh, introduced me. And this is a very, very dangerous thing to do politically. This is the coalition that has held together for 60 years, and Republicans have had at least our share of majorities and presidencies and success electorally with this coalition, right? It consists of economic libertarians, defense hawks, uh, and social conservatives, to put it you know, in, in its simplest terms. Where are we as a coalition if we say that the economic libertarians are no longer welcome? Where are we if we say we're no longer committed to economic freedom? So what should we do? Um, I think we should acknowledge that many nuclear families are struggling, that families don't have the community support that they once had, extended families live apart, civil society, as I said before, is in decline. I think we should acknowledge that we're raising kids in a coarsened, often debased culture, and we should be right. We're right to worry about what kind of values that culture is instilling. I think there's a need for civil society to promote virtue. That is something civil society can and should do, and these are all really important, legitimate issues for conservatives to grapple with. But I think it's equally important to remember that capitalism has not caused the decline of civil society and the decline of virtue. And weakening capitalism is unlikely to restore the virtue in civil society. Rather, I think we should focus, as we have historically, on opportunity rather than guaranteed outcomes. To me, at the heart of that is education. Um, we should be great champions for moving education in a direction in which it can benefit from the tremendous uh, powers of market forces. We should have school choice. We should have competition between lots of different models to, to constantly be discovering the best way to deliver that service to kids. We should remove disincentives to work. That's going to mean significantly reforming our entitlement programs. But above all, I think we ought to be promoting growth and economic freedom. I, I fully understand growth does not solve all problems, but it does make all problems easier to solve. You know, last month I had a visit from a young man, he's 18 year old, I'm, we'll call him Michael. He's from Springdale, Pennsylvania, which is exactly the kind of community that the folks who are advocating for this hyphenated capitalism say they want to help. This is a community, the population is in decline, formerly industrial, used to have a lot of middle-class blue-collar jobs and now not so much. It's not too far from Pittsburgh. 
And um, it's, it's a mostly white, low-income, not college-educated uh, population. So this fellow, Michael, came to visit my office. He's a member of the Civil Air Patrol, and that was what, what brought him to town. He's a high school senior, and I said, so, Michael, what's next for you? But he lit up, almost jumped out of his seat. He said, I'll tell you what's next. I'm going to a training program. I'm going to learn to become a welder. I got a little taste of it at our uh, high school program, and it's really cool. I think I'm going to be really good at it. I said, I'm, I start right after graduation. So I'm thinking to myself, you know what's going to happen to Michael? He's going to go through that welding program. I'm not sure whether that's nine months or 12 months or how long that takes. He's going to get a certification. And then he's going to have a tough decision because he's going to have so many job offers at $50,000, $60,000 a year right out of the gates. And he'll do that for a while. A year from now, his pay will be that much higher. I don't know. Maybe it's seventy dollars or 80000 unless... He decides he's willing to move to a less hospital climate, like maybe in the Dakotas or Alaska, because then he can make $125,000 a year, unless he decides that he'll work overtime and really knock himself out, because what the heck, he's 21 years old, he's got a lot of energy, he's a strong kid. And then he could close in on $200,000 a year as a kid in his early to mid-20s. Why do I use this example? First of all, it's real, okay? This, this just happened just last week. And I know that not everyone wants to be a welder, and that's fine. But my point is, there are five and a half million kids that are going to graduate from high school this spring, together with Michael. And he, and many, many of them, have terrific opportunities like this because we've had a strong economy. Because with a booming economy, it creates demand for people like Michael. So my warning to my colleagues who think we need to change capitalism be very careful about how much damage you do to economic growth because how many kids like Michael are going to lose the chance to get a great job and launch a great career that they're really excited about that will allow them to support a family, that will allow them to do all the things that we want for, for young people and, and not so young people. Be really careful about the damage you do to his prospects for the sake of some other goal. So I, I think there's more we can do to make sure more people have the opportunity to thrive. Education and opportunity are what we should be focused on, but not policies that undermine free enterprise and are likely to leave us all poorer and probably no more equal. So, so my conclusion for, for those, those of us who are the fellow travelers uh, of uh, the conservative movement, the center-right, Let's not succumb to this pressure to adopt the premise of the left and start diminishing capitalism. Let's acknowledge there is no political or economic system that results in everyone being rich and everyone being equally rich, but capitalism certainly creates the best condition for the largest number of people, and no one is systematically left out. And entrepreneurial capitalism has lifted billions of people out of poverty. And we do live in one of the greatest times of peace and prosperity ever. And we have a record high standard of living. I just don't think we should throw this away lightly. And I think we also should have the humility of recognizing uh, there's very little that the government does well. Do we really want to give it even more power and more authority? I would suggest instead we recommit ourselves to ensuring that conservatives continue to champion economic freedom and pro the prosperity and growth that come from it. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon. My name is Tommy Binion. I'm the Vice President of Government Relations here at the Heritage Foundation. We're going to move into a, a period of uh, moderated question and answers. I've got a couple of questions of my own uh, to ask the senator, and, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Senator, great speech. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, much for giving it me. here at Heritage. Uh, there was uh, so much in your speech that, uh, that we agreed with. Right off the bat, I know that Jack Spencer's in the room, and, and he appreciated your shout out and, and, and your defense of, of, uh, of the mindset that uh, economic freedom is really an important lens uh, from which to be viewing policy. Uh, my first question, I want to get right to the heart of the matter. I, 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 I think everybody in the room uh, agrees that there is an emerging group of center-right capitalist skeptics. 
why are they gaining steam now? Are they practicing populism, or have we as a movement forgotten how to defend our founding principles? Um, so so I'm, I'm always very uh, reluctant to attribute motives to, to, to people. Um, I'm sure that, first of all, I, I'm completely convinced they're all sincere, and they, mm -hmm. they think this is good policy. I, I obviously don't agree, but um, I don't question their motives. I do think that it is at some level at least inspired by the wave of populism that has swept the globe. Uh, this um, has been an amazing phenomenon. It's been very recent. It's happened very suddenly. And it's hard to imagine that this, the perception of the political power of populism is not contributing to, to this way of thinking. Yeah, I, 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 I totally agree. Um, it is interesting that uh, that uh, it, it is it, it is happening uh, not just in our movement here in this country, but around the globe. Uh, you mentioned around the globe. Um, one thing I wanted to touch on today was China. Uh, this is an area of focus for the group of folks that we've been talking about. We have an important relationship with China economically with respect to trade. We also have an important competition going on with China. How should we think about that relationship uh, if if uh, we want to have this worldview. Yeah, it, it's a great question, and it's it's one that we're going to wrestle with for decades, I suspect. So I, it's best I can tell. This is the first time in American history, probably modern world history, that we have had the rise of a near-peer uh, potential adversary who has quickly emerged as a great power, and it's happened in the context of an increasingly integrated economy, right? There, we've had near peers, we've had adversaries, but we did not have a, an economy integrated with them the way we do with China. We benefit economically from our trade with China. I think that's, that's an unambiguous fact. But China poses unique risks by virtue of their own ambitions, the geopolitics of it. So I think we have to be clear-eyed about this. I, for instance, think that it is reasonable for us to consider um, avoiding excessive dependence on national security um, matters. Uh, you know, rare earth minerals come to mind. It's dangerous to have any one country be a sole supplier of something that's really essential for our security and our well-being. Um, and it's that much more dangerous if it's a potential adversary or certainly a competitor. So I, I think we do need to treat China differently than we would treat, you know, Canada and Mexico and the EU. Um, but I certainly hope that the relationship evolves in a way that allows us to continue to have the benefit of a significant amount of, uh, uh, you know, economic trade. Sure, uh, I, I, I agree with that. W one last question for me, and, and then we'll open it up. To the audience, um, you know, you told some stories of your travels around the state of Pennsylvania, and I really heard a lot of optimism and a lot of sense of, of economic opportunity. Uh, our friends in the center right that are skeptical of capitalism focus on, I, I think, a, a different uh, narrative, which is that things have really stagnated for a, a certain group of the population. I see, like you, much greater opportunity and much greater optimism. Uh, I think the uh, I think the economy is is fundamentally really strong despite what's happening in the in the stock market today, um, and that as conservatives we need to wrestle with uh, exactly what the what the accurate state of the economy is for certain groups of people. Any comment on that? Well, look, uh, you know, in my travels I take me to communities that are not doing well. Uh, you know, I get to I get to towns and little boroughs, for instance, that maybe. Maybe they really grew up around a single big employer, mm -hmm. and everybody did well while that employer was doing well, and that employer's gone. Um, in most cases, most likely, that employer's not coming back mm -hmm. because the world has changed, and that's part of a dynamic economy. So I don't mean to be cavalier about that, um, but fortunately, most of those communities are not very far from somewhere that's thriving, somewhere where there's demand for work, somewhere where there are opportunities. And usually it's commuting distance. So uh, it does mean things are always changing, and, and that's, that's still the case. But yeah, overall, the economy in Pennsylvania is strong. Unemployment is low. Business is growing. The single most frequently cited challenge that 
small and medium-sized business owners raise in my meetings with them is inability to find enough folks to fill the job openings that they have. So that's a problem, but it's the right problem to have. Right, absolutely. Uh, very interesting stuff. Questions from the audience? Uh, yes, sir, wait, wait for the microphone to come. Right here in the front. Thank you, Senator. I'm Satoshi Nishiata from Happy Science. Uh, more, a growing number of younger generation uh, show the support for communism and socialism. Now, according to a survey of victims of communism last year, uh, one third of millennials perceive communism, communism as favorable. Uh, it, it looks like younger generation has been infected by communism virus or something. Uh, so uh, what do you think is the main reason for this phenomenon? And what should we do to confront this, uh, considering the future of the United States? Thank you. Yeah, uh, um, it, that's a really important question, I think, to think about. Um, let me start by saying, I think it has generally been the case for a long time that younger folks are more likely to have a cohort that considers itself extremely liberal than most of the rest of the population. Now, it might be even bigger than it's been historically. It might be people willing to embrace something that's further left uh, than, than we've seen historically. And so that's why we can't ignore it, even though I don't think it's necessarily a, a devastating phenomenon. Look, I think it's interesting that a clear and decisive majority of Democratic primary voters are explicitly, it seems, choosing not to go down the socialist path. I'm encouraged that the other major political party in America, having taken a run at this, that run seems to be failing. That's, that's good news. But ultimately, I have, to, I have to say, I think it's a damning indictment on our education. You can't know the history of the 20th century and come away thinking that there's anything really redeemable about communism. And you should be deeply skeptical even about socialism. And so if people don't know that, in my mind, it suggests that they haven't learned the history of you know the last 100 years. Thank you. We have a question here and then a question here. Hello, Senator Toomey. Uh, my name is Ben. I'm an intern at the Senate Budget Committee, which you serve on. And my question is, do you believe that there's any distinction between the free market capitalism of large Wall Street firms versus the free market capitalism of a mom and pop shop on Main Street? And should US policy reflect that? So I, I mean, I think the way we should think about it is, you know, economic freedom is economic freedom. And we shouldn't curb economic freedom because you've become large, for instance. Um, w there's, there's a role for government regulation. It should really be focused on preventing fraud and theft and any externalities that are harmful to society that are not captured uh, when the business engages in them. That's, that's a legitimate role. But I don't think we should say, well, we're going to have a threshold and above a certain threshold, we're going to start to impose some kind of onerous penalties or even taxes or, or, or something else in an attempt to systematically advantage smaller organizations. We, we don't need to do that, and, and it would end up, I think, impeding growth. Thank you very much, Ben. Yes, sir. Um, Bill Lane, uh, Senator, it's honored to be here. Terrific uh, presentation. Um, when you think in terms of the last couple of years, we had the tax cut, which greatly stimulated the economy and sort of set the stage for some robust economic growth coupled with uh, regulatory reform and as you were talking about with judges. Um, but it also gave a sense of confidence that we could go it alone in a trade policy where we imposed tariffs on many of our closest allies. Uh, we had 232 tariffs on allies. We had 301 tariffs on China. We had immigration tariffs on uh, Mexico and on and on. Um, the economy slowed. I mean, for the last year and a half, you've seen the manufacturing sector sort of, you see the brakes being tapped on economic growth. You've seen the ag sector where there's really been a slow down in economic growth. And in the last, let's say, 10 weeks, we've seen dramatic economic growth as the consumers are scared for a variety of reasons. Right. Um, everyone's looking for ways to stimulate the economy. Is it time for Congress to get involved and make it clear that we need a stimulus and part of that stimulus needs to be an end of these tariffs. 
Um, well, uh, Bill, first of all, thanks for coming. Good to see you. Um, thanks for the question. Uh, what what I think we ought to be doing, and, and you know, I've introduced legislation that would restore to Congress the responsibility for these 232 tariffs. So 232 is the section of the trade law that authorizes a president to impose tariffs if he believes that the product to which he would apply the tariffs is, is a threat to American national security, the importation of it. Um, look, it's just not the case that steel and aluminum from Mexico and Canada is a threat to American national security. It's not the case that BMWs and Volkswagens that we import are a threat to American national security. Um, it is a delegated uh, authority. The Constitution assigns that responsibility to Congress. We have delegated too much authority, in my view, to the executive. And so I'm advocating that we take that back. If, if in my legislation, a president wishing to impose these tariffs on the basis of, of a threat to national security would have to come to Congress since it is our responsibility. And if he convinces Congress that there is indeed a threat to the American security, I'm sure we would vote to permit the tariffs. But it would be a tougher hurdle for him to get over. And I think if we restored that balance and we restored that responsibility to where the Constitution assigns it, I think the business investment climate would improve. People would realize, okay, it's less likely. Like, let's be honest. We, we learned a little almost a year ago that the president can wake up one morning and decide, hmm, we'll have a 25% tariff on everything coming from Mexico. Um, and that's a com country we had a free trade agreement with. Well, that's a problem. And, and if the president had to come to Congress to get an approval before he, he could do that, then the risk of that actually happening would be diminished dramatically. Thanks, Bill. We've got time for maybe one question. Yes, sir. Yes, thank you, Ralph Enko, chairman of the Council of Reason. And I'm thrilled at your presentation. Thank you. But I have a question, and that is, why aren't there another 53 United States why aren't there another 53 United States senators singing from your hymnal? Why are there, why are there so few Republican elected officials and enlightened Democratic elected officials, if we can find any, who are singing the praises of capitalism, which has been exactly as you pointed out, a stunning humanitarian success story? Yeah, I, th I think there is still a consensus among Republican um, members of Congress for economic freedom and capitalism. But there is this emerging alternative set of ideas. And, and so I just feel like it's very, very important to engage in this debate and not simply cede this ground at all. Um, and I think uh, we don't know yet how that's going to turn out. But I can assure you, I, I'm not the only one that has these views. Well, to the audience, thank you for your fantastic questions. To our friends watching online, thank you for your attendance today. Uh, to Senator Toomey, thank you so much for coming to the Heritage Foundation. Uh, have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Very much. Great speech. Thank you. Yeah.